Good morning and welcome to everyone who's tuning in to this morning's webinar. My name is Bu Singh and I'm a partner in Zico IP Kuala Lumpur. I'll be your moderator for this morning's session. Now, the topic for today is tackling online counterfeiting and IP infringement in the new norm era. In this webinar, we have a panel of speakers from the various Zico IP offices in Southeast Asia and a guest speaker from Indonesia who will speak on the various measures that are in place in Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia to combat online counterfeiting, as well as share their experience on anti-counterfeiting strategies in their respective countries. Now, just let me introduce the speakers for today. I'll start with our guest speaker, Rafi Udarojat. Rafi is the manager of the Public Policy and Government Relations in Indonesia E-Commerce Association, or IDEA, IDEA. He regularly engages with the central government, business associations, and stakeholders on e-commerce related issues and public policies obstacles faced by stakeholders. He also previously held a similar position in a prominent online marketplace in Indonesia. Joining Rofi will be my colleague and partner in Zico IP Kuala Lumpur, Siuling, Titi Rat from the Zico IP Bangkok office, and Andra from Zico IP Jakarta office. Now, before we move on to the uh, topic, um, just some housekeeping. If you have any questions, please feel free to let us know via the chat box. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of this session. Please also leave your name and email address together with your question. In case we do not have sufficient time to answer your questions, uh, we, will, we will reach out to you by email. Allow me to give you a brief introduction of the topic today and also a summary of the position in Malaysia. Now, online counterfeiting or online IP infringement is a growing phenomenon and has a direct correlation with the rise in prominence of e-commerce. Through technology, online marketplaces have made goods and services so much more accessible now, and not to mention the various trading sites and social media. Since the start of the COVID-19 outbreak, there has been a spike in demand for essential items such as sanitizers, face masks, PPEs or personal protective equipment. Also, there's an increase in demand for healthcare products, medicines and health supplements. Now, due to the lockdown imposed in many countries, um, it also disrupted the supply chain of uh, genuine goods. Now, this inevit inevitably, this creates an opportunity for counterfeiters. Because of COVID-19 and the subsequent lockdown of movement control measures taken in many countries, including in Southeast Asia, many businesses are encouraged or have in fact shifted their focus to an online business model as consumers moved online to shop and purchase products at their leisure. A survey conducted by a global market research firm uh, recently showed that 48% of Malaysians surveyed are buying things online more during the COVID-19 period. And in line with this new norm, the Malaysian government head of this June 2020, which is just last Friday, announced a stimulus package, which included an initiative called Shop Online Malaysia to encourage online shopping and allocated close to our, uh, 700 million ringgit Malaysia for the digitalization of uh, small and medium sized businesses as part of the national recovery plan. So you can see that e-commerce is being encouraged more and more now in Malaysia. Now with the boom in e-commerce and online shopping, there's also an increase in online counterfeiting. One of the um, state national consumer complaint center in Malaysia reported that there has been an increase in number of complaints lodged where 20% of complaints relate to fake goods. We will very shortly take a look at the situation in Indonesia and Thailand. For, the for Thailand, I would like to ask my colleague from Thailand, Titi Rat, to give a brief overview of the impact of COVID-19 on online counterfeiting in Thailand. Over to you, Titi Rat. Thank you, Busang. Uh, in Thailand, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started uh, around the end of February this year. Uh, and on the 24th of March, the Thai government declared a state of emergency in order to uh, manage the situation. Although this is not a strict lockdown, we have restrictions and uh, evening curfew that affect a lot of people and businesses. 
shopping malls and markets were ordered to be closed uh, temporarily until the situation gets better. Business owners who used to run a shop in shopping malls and markets, uh, they had no choice but to shift their business to the online platform. Some use Instagram or Facebook, some use uh, uh, online marketplaces like Lazada or Shopee. Of course, the, the infringers in Thailand, they now try to sell their counterfeit goods online too. Uh, I found a statistic showing that in the past five years, the growth rate of e-commerce or online shopping in Thailand, by uh, it's about uh, eight to ten percent each year, and with the current situation where we have to stay home and a lot of people have to work or study from home, there's no doubt that the, the growth rate for e-commerce or online shopping this year will be much more significant than the previous years. Uh, Thai people become more and more familiar with online shopping now. Some of them find that it's convenient, just a click away and some of them find that there are a lot of promotion and good deals out there. But one thing that buyers need to realize is that there's a, a significant disadvantage for online shopping. Uh, it's because they cannot uh, inspect or check the goods before purchasing. Some people purchase counterfeit goods online without knowing until they receive the package delivery at home. This is because a lot of infringers, they use uh, nice picture, uh, pictures of uh, genuine products or copies from the uh, original catalog for their advertisement. The other factor that may contribute to the increased number of counterfeit goods online is that uh, the law enforcement authorities, as you know, they, they have been busy working under the uh, state of emergency. So recently, we do not hear a lot of news regarding police raids. Again, uh, counterfeit factories or shops selling counterfeit goods uh, as often as before. This probably uh, make them feel more comfortable doing illegal business. Uh, and this probably contribute to, to the reason why we have uh, more counterfeit goods in the, in the, on the internet uh, currently. Okay, uh, just for the position in Indonesia, uh, can I invite uh, Rofi to give a, a update on what's happening in Indonesia? Thank you, Busang, uh, and good morning all. Uh, yeah, as we know that uh, the, the COVID-19 has a big impact on us and our community, uh, not only in Indonesia, but across the globe. And as we know that it has uh, uh, influence on how we uh, 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 consume uh, daily, you know, it has an impact on our changing behavior. So I think, uh, you know, in our e-commerce industry in Indonesia is also uh, changing our consuming behavior. For example, there is an increase uh, of the some uh, items in our categories. For example, there is an increase in face masks, hand sanitizer, and those meds, uh, supplements, you know, vitamin, uh, and those, uh, and also the, the 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 household goods, you know, as the people spend more time in home in in their houses, in her, in their houses. And uh, however, uh, we haven't found any uh, increased reports on the IP infringement cases or the the counterfeiting products. Uh, you know, because we rely heavily on on the reports from the trademark owner and as well as the, the public report, for example. And in Indonesia, we, we also rely on the public, uh, public complaints. For example, if some people found uh, or have a complaints about some certain products in, uh, in the online marketplaces, they will uh, tell the public, you know, the media will report it. Uh, and in Indonesia, uh, as we know, uh, I mean, as far as we know, we haven't found any increasing uh, cases uh, in those uh, products, the increasing products like face masks, uh, hand sanitizer, and probably because of the, uh, you know, in Indonesia, in in the first stage, in the beginning stage of the COVID-19, we actually uh, experiencing 
lack of those uh, uh, important or critical uh, goods. Uh, for example, face masks, we are really, uh, the face masks are really scarce uh, in Indonesia. So I think people, if I can say uh, frankly that people don't uh, think about, our consumers don't really think about the how it is a counterfeit product or it is the original product uh, from from the trademark owner. So it's actually, but uh, you know, actually, uh, my point is in Indonesia, uh, definitely we have a big impact on our changing consumers' behavior. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, we haven't found any uh, increasing reports or cases uh, regarding the IP infringement or counterfeiting. Back to you, Buseng. Thank you very much, Rofi, for that uh, interesting update in Indonesia. Andra, do you have any comments to add on the situation in Indonesia? Uh, thank you, Buseng, and good morning, all. Yes, as, uh, as mentioned before by, by all of you, yeah, the COVID-19 impact in Southeast Asia countries. Uh, well, Indonesia is more or less the same. Yeah, because uh, the government is declared that in early March uh, there are two cases for COVID-19, and also the, the cases is increased uh, rapidly. And since the 13 April, uh, the Indonesian government declared that this COVID-19 is a national disaster, and then the large-scale social distancing is applied. So on the effect of that, all malls are closed. Uh, most activities can only be conducted from home, like work, study, study and pray, except for uh, certain businesses like uh, grocery stores and restaurants are allowed to open, but with the strict rules and protocols. Uh, well, uh, business is also slowing down, employees being terminated, which leads to the increased number of unemployment. And according to the national development planning agencies, the unemployment raised to two to three million people in early May. And as an impact, and as also previously mentioned by uh, Rofi, the online sales business is strengthening. They are switching their business from offline to online. This switching is not only for a small medium enterprise, but also the big distributor switch their business strategy. Uh, uh, yeah. According to the data, the increased number of small businesses raised about 350% in Indonesia. And most, uh, mostly they sell uh, basic needs, instant food, and also health and sanitary products. Like yeah, face masks and hand sanitizer and thermometer. The switching business method from offline to online may increase uh, a number of counterfeit products sold on the online marketplace. Yeah, because the brand owners may not aware of the infringement before the stores are switching to online or the small medium enterprise may not be aware of the use of others IP. Yeah, I think that's from me, Busan. Thank you very much, Andra. Now that we have a snapshot of the general landscape in the three countries, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, let's find out what are some of the available measures that you can take in these countries to tackle online uh, counterfeiting or online IP infringement. We will first talk about the position in Malaysia, uh, followed by uh, the position in Thailand and Indonesia. For the position in Malaysia, uh, could we hear from Siu Ling? Good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, I would like to start uh, with a brief explanation on the types of uh, online infringement that we are discussing today. Um, online infringement typically assumes one of uh, these uh, several forms. First, which is the most common and obvious one, the sale of counterfeits or fake products through online platforms uh, such as uh, Shopee, Lazada, Amazon or even social media, such as Facebook, or copycat websites. Secondly, use of the same or similar brands or trademarks in advertisements or promotions to promote and sell fake or counterfeit products, 
and also counterfeit listings on online platforms. Thirdly, fake or copycat websites through the integration of trademarks in domain names or social media handles. And fourthly, use of copyrighted materials such as photographs, logos, and product literature or write-ups to sell or promote fake products. The primary IP rights that we rely on to enforce against such online infringement activities are trademark and copyright laws. Now, in Malaysia, under our current laws, we have recourse to civil action, administrative, as well as criminal action. Whichever course of action is preferred, the first step towards enforcement should always be evidence gathering. This could assume the form of a simple test purchase where you retain proof of the purchase, such as receipts, delivery documents, and of course, the counterfeit product. You should take screenshots of the relevant web pages for record purposes and video record the order and purchase process where possible. If the infringement is widespread or you believe that the infringer could be an importer or wholesaler, then it may be worth a while to conduct deeper investigation to ascertain if there's a physical warehouse, storage, or distribution center. Online enforcement strategies vary according to the types of infringement. Now, the most immediate and cost-effective means if infringement occurs through online retailer or marketplace, such as Lazada, Shopee, Amazon, or social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, is to lodge a complaint with these sites and request a takedown of the infringing post or listing. Some online platforms have quite comprehensive IP infringement policies and sites like Facebook, Amazon, Shopee, even have prescribed forms to fill out complaints on IP infringement. From our experience, the takedown can be done fairly quickly if all requested information is complete when we lodge the complaint. But this does not guarantee that the infringer will stop. It may go to alternative channels, change its identity, and repeat the infringement. Therefore, if we are able to identify the real culprit behind the infringement, we would advise sending a cease and desist letter to extract a personal undertaking from the infringer. The undertakings that we normally seek include to immediately cease all infringing activities and not to commit further infringement in the future, withdrawal of the counterfeit products from the marketplace, delivery up of the counterfeit products or destruction on both as may be applicable or desired, and payment towards some costs and damages. If the infringer has a website offering for sale counterfeit goods or uses fake or copycat websites to do so, we could lodge a complaint with the Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs. The Ministry will then work with the Multimedia Commission and the relevant telcos to block the website if they find that there is basis to the complaint. If the infringer has a warehouse or storage that can be located within the country, then the raid by the Ministry is also a viable option. Now, this will be a criminal enforcement action that is conducted by the Ministry on the complaint of the IP owner. And lastly, if the infringer operates on a large-scale basis and is an identifiable person or entity, it may be worth commencing civil action in court to get a permanent court order for injunction and damages. Now, whichever route we take will depend on the nature of the infringement and the extent of the infringement. So you could do civil action combined with uh, criminal or administrative action or individually. Um, that's all for me, Bruceing. Thank you very much, Suling, for your succinct and very practical comments. Pichirat, could you please give us a rundown on the position in Thailand? Sure, Bruceing. <clears throat> from my experience, uh, the key of successful IP enforcement start from investigation. It's important to for the band, brand owner to engage or select a skillful and experienced uh, investigation team 
Uh, this is because the counterfeiters are smarter now these days. They are, can get very sensitive when some people try to conduct, conduct a track purchase or obtain some information from them or even do a pretext interview. If they become suspicious and agitated, they can simply move their operation underground or they can just simply abandon their old website and register a new one. So this will jeopardize our work and also uh, make it much more difficult to track down and take actions against them next time. For counterfeit goods in the actual market in Thailand, our recommendation for the most uh, practical and effective method is to conduct a criminal rate action. For criminal rate action in Thailand, we usually work with the uh, ECD police, the Economic Crime Suppression Division, which belongs to the Royal Thai Police, or the other government unit called the DSI, the Department of Special Investigation, which belongs to the Ministry of Justice. The reason we often are prefer working with these two teams is that they have the uh, law enforcement officers who are experienced and knowledgeable in IP enforcement. They are reliable. They know us. Uh, we know them very well. So uh, things usually go quite smoothly. And uh, for uh, criminal rate actions in Thailand, the procedure is quite straightforward. You start from gathering evidence and then uh, file a complaint, either uh, for trademark infringement or copyright infringement uh, at the police station or with the DSI. And then they would uh, consider your case and obtain the search warrant from the IP and IT court. After receiving the search warrant, then we will go with them, with the officials, to conduct the raid. If the raid becomes successful, the goods will be confiscated and uh, destroyed after. For the infringers, they will be arrested at the red scene and, after, and later prosecuted under the Trademark Act or the Copyright Act in the IP and IT court. And for counterfeit goods in the online market, uh, the brand owners have an option to conduct a raid action with the DSI or the police as well. But in addition to that, they can rely on the Computer Crime Act and work with another governmental unit called the TCSD, Technology Crime Suppression Division, which belongs to the Ministry of uh, Digital Economy and Society. This law enforcement unit is like a, a cyber police in Thailand. They are law enforcement officers with uh, technical knowledge on IT. So they can help you conduct the raid and also they can do an in-depth investigation online and help you submit uh, a motion to the IP and IT court in order to obtain a permanent injunction to remove or block that the website selling counterfeit goods for you. For copyright owners who find uh, infringing materials online, they can rely on Copyright Act and uh, file a motion at the IP and IT court in order to obtain uh, a, an, a preliminary injunction ordering the internet service provider in Thailand to uh, remove the infringing content or materials and then they can file a lawsuit after. And besides all these criminal actions that I mentioned, there are other options available for brand owner as well. I often recommend my clients to send a cease and desist letter first or uh, entering the case into the mediation process at the Department of Intellectual Property. The other fast and simple option is also to file a complaint or a IP violation report directly to Facebook or Instagram or the marketplace websites. 
last but not least, uh, proactive actions is always uh, quite helpful. I always recommend my client to proceed with custom recordation, uh, join the public alert on IP matters, or support the government officers by giving them training or educational programs. This will encourage them to work harder and to understand uh, your concerns. Back to you, Prasen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Itirat. Um, very interesting to know about cyber, cyber police in Thailand and also their role in uh, combating uh, counterfeits in Thailand. For Indonesia, Andra, can you give us a brief overview about the available measures there to deal with online infringement? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, in general, if we found any counterfeit products in the market, the first thing that we have to do is conducting an investigation and gathering information on the counterfeiters. Once complete, we can then uh, send a cease and desist letter to the infringer because we know uh, where they are, we know they, where he is, or where he is and also ask them to sign the undertaking letter. If the set action is failed, we can then proceed with a civil lawsuit or criminal report. A criminal report, we can go to the police and also we can go to the DGIP. In the DGIP, we have a, or we call it civil servant. Actually, in the Indonesian copyright law, there is an article that provides prohibition for a marketplace to let uh, the sale and or uh, duplication of goods resulting from the violation of copyright and related rights at the marketplace under their management. Specifically for uh, user-generated content e-commerce, there is a circular letter from the Ministry of Communication and Information that limits the responsibility and obligation of platform owners for trade with user-generated content, where they have an obligation to provide a system or a way to report the prohibited content. And one of them is if the content is infringing other party IP. So if we found a counterfeit products in online marketplace, uh, we can send the cease and desist letter through the marketplace by providing them with the link and the reason of the report on the prohibited content and also provide them with the supporting evidence uh, like a screenshot, trademark certificate, uh, and so on. Uh, also based on the circular letter, the obligation for the online marketplace manager only limited to uh, conduct verification with the complainant report and request the complainant to complete the requirements or any additional information on the infringement. Uh, the second one is to uh, delete, delete or block the unlawful content. And the third one is provide notification to the merchant that the content uploaded by the merchant is unlawful. And also uh, they can provide a tools for the merchant to respond to the report. And also they can refuse the report if the content reported is not unlawful content. It means that once the infringing content is blocked, we cannot prevent the infringer from re-uploading the infringing content. Yeah. Same as in uh, Malaysia also, most online marketplaces also will not disclose the identity of the, their users or sellers. Yeah. Uh, further, for copyright infringement conducted through other means such as a website, Indonesia have a Minister of Law and Human Rights and also the Minister of Communication and Informatics Joint Regulation regarding the implementation of content closing and or access right of the copyright infringement or related right user in the electronic system where copyright or uh, related right owners can request for blocking of the website. I think that's it for me to say. Thank you very much, Andra. Um, interesting to note that copyright laws are used quite quite extensively in Indonesia. 
to battle counterfeits. Now, uh, we have heard from the legal side, the, the perspective of lawyers. Can we get perhaps a perspective from the uh, online marketplace? Rofi, you were formerly working with an online marketplace, and now, of course, you are with the Indonesia E-Commerce Association. Can you share with us your experience on what are some of the measures um, taken by the online marketplace operators to tackle online counterfeiting? Uh, so basically, what are the channels of complaint for brand owners or IP owners, and what are the consequences? Yeah, uh, thank you, Busan. Yeah, as we know that most of the online marketplaces are the UGC uh, platform, the user-generated content that the the those uh, the infringe IP infringement cases coming from some people that you know upload their own content and uh, without uh, the knowledge from the platform themselves. And uh, I would say that, uh, however, we we have uh, the IP IPR law. Uh, in Indonesia and as well as the the circular letter from the ICT uh, minister uh, regarding about uh, you know the negative content in the online platform that we I mean of course there's a safe harbor or the limitation of the consequences for the platforms because it, it is the UGC platform but as but also the uh, but there is also the responsibilities from the platform to take down the uh, the, the the negative contents uh, includes including in this case are the IP infringing uh, infringement and the counterfeiting products and uh, I would say that uh, the most of the companies would uh, would comply to those uh, regulations and uh, I would er advice to all the companies to all the trademark owners that uh, actually uh, you know uh, experiencing disadvantages from uh, the counterfeiting in the online platforms to re to send a letter to request takedowns uh, regarding those uh, regarding those products in the online marketplaces um, uh, current practices or observations regarding the IPR protection request mostly come from outside of Indonesia. So the companies that request, request takedowns to the, the online marketplaces uh, uh, as well uh, as far as um, where are coming from the outside of Indonesia. Most are obviously trademark infringement and we uh, uh, sure to take down these uh, products is uh, we have to follow the procedure. And we need to some time after receiving notice claims along with complete information from you to make the necessary legal review internally uh, in each of the uh, uh, the platforms. Uh, obviously, the platforms have their own procedure that I can't really have uh, uh, advice on which uh, standards or how many days, but obviously in the circular letter there has already the guides you know how many days that this uh, then th that this uh, product can be ta taken down from the online marketplaces um, yeah i think uh, uh, that's all from me so uh, i would advise from for all of the terma owners to send a letter to follow the procedure and the request take down and I can say that uh, most uh, or all of the online marketplaces would comply to the to the to the circular letter number five, uh, 2016. And uh, but however, we can't guarantee the the, uh, the you know the standard procedure, how many days, how many, uh, how fast it can be, you know, or how uh, if you can send. For example, thousand links. For example, it can really uh, require a lot of time. But yeah, that's how it works because it differs. It differs among the platform. Thank you, Busen. Thank you, Rofi, for that very uh, insightful comments from the online marketplace perspective. Now, from what we have heard thus far, it would seems that there are adequate laws and measures in place in in the countries to tackle online. IP infringement or online counterfeiting. I have a question here for Tiu Ling. What should brand owners do to level up, to take up the fight against the counterfeiters? And how should brand owners leverage on technology? 
Yeah, hi, good thing. Um, we all probably agree that uh, with online shopping um, and online retail sales, trademarks and brands become very important because that is one of the means in which consumers um, can uh, be can have some assurance as to the quality um, of the goods that they purchase. So having trademarks and brands and spending a lot of money to market it is one thing, but if we do not uh, protect these brands and trademarks, then it will be very difficult um, to take any action, whether it's administrative, civil or criminal. So I have uh, earlier outlined the legal measures that uh, we could all take, and I believe uh, my Titirat, uh, Rofi, as well as uh, Andrew have also mentioned similar measures. Um, and I believe that uh, for a start, for IP owners, it's very important to register brands um, and even their distinctive domain names as trademarks. Without trademark registration, the ease and effectiveness of enforcement against online infringement will be seriously impaired. For instance, in Malaysia, there is no recourse to criminal enforcement without a registered trademark. We also need to bear in mind that trademark protection and enforcement is still largely territorial in nature, even if online infringement could be borderless. So it is imperative for brand owners or IP owners to register their marks in all of the markets of interest and also countries uh, where counterfeiting activities are rife. As for copyright protection, there is generally no re registration requirement but for enforcement purposes, one still needs to generate legally admissible documents to prove copyright ownership and subsistence. Now, in Malaysia, this would normally be the swearing of a statutory declaration pursuant to our Copyright Act. And there is also the option of lodging a voluntary notification of copyright with the Malaysian IP office. Um, by doing so, there is thus a legal presumption raised that uh, you own and uh, have copyright in the uh, material that you wish to claim. Now that is the legal part. From the technology standpoint, um, various product authentication methods have been increasingly deployed on physical genuine products over the years. Companies used to affix um, security holograms on their products, um, but even such holograms can be faked. We have now the advance of uh, artificial intelligence or AI and blockchain technology um, where digital certificates can be produced. Um, they can digitally identify genuine products through unique serial numbers or QR codes. And this is gaining traction, but there is of course cost in deploying such technology. So from my experience, I can only observe um, higher value products um, tending to embrace such a uh, technology. So luxury goods such as uh, watches, jewellery, alcohol products, they are adopters of uh, technology to combat counterfeiting. Perhaps in time to come, um, when technology becomes more widespread and the cost of deployment of such technology comes down, then perhaps um, this will be one of the solutions, I believe, uh, to the rampant uh, counterfeiting um, activities online, especially when you can't inspect uh, products prior to purchase Having digital certificate, I think, will go a long way, especially if you're buying um, expensive products online. But for now, for most uh, mass consumed products, I would say that the legal measures that we have outlined probably um, remain the only viable option against uh, counterfeiting. That's all for me. Thank you, Siuling. Teacher, do you have any comments which are specific for Thailand? Uh, for Thailand, I think the government really recognized the importance of uh, IP protection. So even during the COVID-19, all the government uh, uh, office and uh, units are open as normal, including the Department of Intellectual Property. Uh, the Department of Intellectual Property open Monday to Friday on its regular schedule. So that, uh, so that the IP protection in Thailand would get disrupt so much. Uh, uh, and they also try to help people who are badly uh, affected by the COVID-19. 
on the 24th of March, the Director General of the DIP uh, make an announcement allowing people or uh, companies, both local and overseas, who are affected by the COVID-19 and unable to file applications or respond to office actions or proceed with any requirement uh, within the official deadline to be able to submit uh, a special request uh, to extend the official deadline under this special circumstance. So uh, I think it's very helpful for a lot of uh, IP owners. And I would like to add that uh, right now, uh, the situation in Thailand is much better. Uh, as you may know that many restrictions have been eased. Uh, shopping malls and market uh, open again. Uh, so I, 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 I predict that people are infringers who uh, sell counterfeit goods online will continue what they do, but they also will go back to the regular market as well now. So it's time for the brand owner to think about uh, conducting a market survey, reevaluate the situation and their strategy for IP enforcement again. Back to you, Busan. Thank you very much, Tikirat. Andra, do you have anything to add for Indonesia? Uh, yes, Hussein. Uh, perhaps uh, the same with the Suling said that since uh, based on the Minister of Communication and Informatic Circular Letter, trademark registration certificate is required for reporting the infringement to the reporting means that available at the online marketplace. If we claim that we the the brand is is, our, is ours or it's us, but we cannot provide the online market uh, place with the trademark certificate, I think uh, the chance of success is very low. Yeah, it is important for the brand owners to register their trademark not only in the uh, in their country of origin but also in many countries. I think also for copyright, even though it is uh, automatic protection where recordation is not required to obtain the legal protection. However, to make it easier to prove of the right, it is important to record it at the IP office. The recordation in Indonesia is quite fast though for a copyright uh, is uh, within, within a week now. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Andra, for your comments. Now, it's very interesting that uh, Siu Ling mentioned the use of uh, artificial intelligence or AI and blockchain as a tool for anti-counterfeiting. Now, Rafi, can we get your comments on this from the online marketplace perspective? Do online marketplaces employ AI in, tra in tracking and verifying counterfeit goods? For example, goods we are selling at incredibly low prices, branded goods we are selling at incredibly low prices could be an indication that the goods are not genuine. Okay, thank you, uh, Buseng. Um, yes, uh, uh, we employ the AI to uh, to encounter the net, the negative contents and illegal products for uh, in in online marketplaces. Uh, for example, so there are some uh, illegal meds, unregistered meds that actually forbidden by the government, uh, the authority. Uh, so we we employ some uh, uh, the keyword blacklist in our platform, for example. So the AI can identify those the illegal items, illegal goods that actually uh, will automatically be taken down from the online marketplaces. However, uh, in terms of uh, uh, IP infringement, counterfeiting, we actually need to be careful because, you know, uh, if, for example, if we use the the keyword blacklisting or to take down uh, in, uh, the AI, uh, uh, we, we employ some AI to take down uh, according to the keyword, it could be really uh, risky and dangerous because it could, uh, you know, it could be risk uh, in, you know, mis, uh, mistreating the original items instead. So, um, uh, we need to be careful here because we really don't have much difference or uh, distinguish how to distinguish, distinguish the 
the counterfeiting and the, the original product. If you say about the, the price, are, if, if you say about the pricing, uh, how could we know? For example, there's some people for, that could probably sell their product. Uh, it's not, it's original, but it's actually the secondhand product. Uh, it could be lower than the market prices. So there's some actually possibility that it also, you know, mistargeted other uh, uh, other product that we don't actually want them to disappear. And so in this case, uh, the, the IP infringement cases, online marketplaces, we can say that we have no uh, capabilities to identify which one is the counterfeit products, which one is the original. So that's why we really advise the trademark owners, the brand owner, that they, they can send us the letter, they can help us to identify which one the counterfeit, their product that actually counterfeited. Uh, so we can take down from there. So uh, I really advise using manual uh, um, identification for this instead of the AI because it's really in the gray area. We can really, sometimes, you know, uh, we can't really identify which one is counterfeit product or which one is really original from the trademark owner, other than the merchant, for example. The merchant could be much uh, different if the trademark owner can open up the store, the official store, for example. So the other, uh, other merchant, uh, even if they really sell the original product, the consumers can distinguish themselves, uh, distinguish their product from the, uh, from the illegal merchant, if I can say. But uh, other than that, uh, that's what I, uh, what I can say. Thank you, Buseng. Thanks, uh, Rofi, for sharing that, uh, some of the concerns. Thanks for sharing some of the concerns that the online marketplaces have. In terms, in terms of counterfeit products, at least um, that will give an idea to uh, legal advisors and brand owners when they uh, deal with online marketplaces or when they collaborate as to what are, what are some of these issues. Now, um, recommendations. Uh, what, what do we want to recommend to in-house counsel or brand owners when dealing with uh, e-commerce platforms and online counterfeit marketplaces when we deal with uh, counterfeit in the new norm? Perhaps a short comment from each speaker starting with Siu Ling, followed by Andra, Titirat, and finally Rofi. Just a short one will do. Okay. Um, like I said, start with your uh, reviewing your portfolio of brands and marks, and uh, of course, your get your copyright um, um, ownership and subsistence documents in order, and uh, look at the countries that you operate in or where you sell um, to make sure that you can take swift action um, you know if the infringing products are sold on the online marketplace you're able to make use of the takedown um, facilities uh, or complain avenue um, and get the uh, sites and listings taken down quickly and of course if you manage to catch on to a big time, you know, infringer, then definitely you need to con contemplate uh, taking serious legal action. Sometimes one or two big cases will be very good examples. And if you are an IP owner and you are known to diligently police and enforce your rights, you will find that um, these infringers will not touch your uh, products after a while, they will move on. So, that, that will be, I think, a starting point for in-house um, IP owners from my view. It's your right. Can we hear from you? Yes, of course. So for me, for me, because uh, different countries react or respond to the COVID-19 pandemic quite differently, uh, I think it's important for the in-house IP managers to get in touch with their IP lawyers or IP counsels in their own countries and different countries in order to identify the impact uh, to their IP rights. Uh, either uh, 
applications, uh, registrations, or any pending cases that they may have. They should check whether the IP office is open as normal. They should also check whether there are some changes in uh, uh, requirement, procedures, or time frame or deadlines. Uh, they also should uh, contact or request their IP lawyers or counsels in different countries to provide them with a summary or an update on the counterfeit goods situations. Uh, they should highlight on any changes in uh, legislation, trend, uh, demand supply or even distribution channel. And uh, after you get all this information, then you can discuss uh, frankly or uh, directly with the IP lawyers or the council to see whether uh, your current plan and strategies uh, still work or any adjustment or any changes should be made into your enforcement program. Back to you, Busan. Thank you, Tijirat. Um, Andra, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, Busan. Uh, just a uh, uh, short point for, for me. Uh, for the brand owners, uh, the brand owners should do the monitoring services regularly, both online and or offline, either in-house or by appointing any third party or any IP consultant or legal consultant. Uh, liaise and consult with the IP consultant in the respective country for any IP matters. And specifically for the local brand owners, they can maintain a relationship with the IP officer. Uh, this is a civil servant, I mean, and also a legal enforcer. Now, the, in the Directorate General of IP, we have a Directorate Investigation and Dispute Resolution. Okay, I think that's for me. So. Rofi, do you have any final comments on this? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, we understand that uh, we have a limitation in terms of capabilities, you know, to uh, counter uh, this uh, infringe IP infringement and counterfeiting, counter, counter, counterfeiting cases. Uh, but we are, uh, we can say that we are commitment to to help the the IP the IP owner, the trademark owner, uh, to, 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 to counter this in IP infringement cases. Uh, we really, of course, we need help from this to identify, as I'm, I have already mentioned, how to, how to tackle and identify and probably send us the letter. And if you need more help in terms of, you know, the identifying who actually behind all of these infringement uh, cases, uh, we can help you if you can provide the criminal investigation letter from the police, for example, if this already going to the investigation, this could help um, more uh, to, to deal with the, our internal legal team. So, uh, but uh, other than that, uh, we can say that we are a commitment to protect the intellectual property rights and also the trust from the trademark owner to sell uh, your product in the uh, online marketplaces in Indonesia. That's all from me. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, looks like we have some time to take some uh, questions. Uh, just let me look run through this list of questions I have here. Um, okay, this one is specifically for Rofi. Now, I think uh, Rofi mentioned some type it, it is a uh, opening comments uh, that there's no data to, to say that there is, has been an increase in the number of online infringement in Indonesia. The question goes like this. Does this mean that the online marketplace has to report uh, monthly or periodically on the infringement reports that they receive from IP owners? Does IDEA or the Indonesian uh, e-commerce association provide other recommendations or policies or rules to online marketplaces as to how to handle reports in addition to the circular letter? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, we have some, uh, again, limitation to that, uh, to impose the, the rule beyond the, circle, uh, the circle, circular letter, because uh, 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 most of the online, online platforms are the UGC and the other, uh, the procedures is already clear that we need to help identify which one is the, 
which one is the product. Uh, I mean, we don't have the data, of, of, uh, of course, but uh, uh, the data will come from the reports that come, that obviously coming from the Therma owner. And uh, I really advise uh, to follow the procedure because other, other than that, I mean, uh, uh, it is really, uh, really difficult to go beyond beyond that uh, procedure that's already been uh, uh, regulated in the circular letter. Thank you, Rofi. Now, um, we have time for another question. This relates to uh, investigations. I think that uh, Pichirat mentioned. Uh, the question goes, how easy and efficient are virtual investigations in practice? And how should companies adjust to this new risk? Uh, what are some of the suggestions uh, or tips that we can make? I would say it, uh, the, diffi the, le the level of difficulties depend on the case-by-case -case basis. There are ways to track, track down the online infringers. Sometimes we use the payment details. Sometimes we track back on the, on the chipping, uh, chipping information. Uh, Sometimes we try to uh, make an excuse to discuss with the, uh, the seller directly, uh, such as uh, claiming damages, something like that, in order to get that email address, the personal email address or the telephone number, then we can uh, uh, track down them that way. Also for more intelligence investigation, uh, I have experience in my previous case where uh, a number of customers receive anonymous uh, SMS from a seller. So in those kind of case, we have to work with the authority, uh, which was the TCSD. They have, an, uh, after, after they conducted investigation and found that a claim is reliable, uh, they can contact the te telecommunication provider or internet service provider to, to give us the information about specific users. And uh, that's very helpful. Back to you, Busan. Uh, I think Sule has something to add to this. Well, I think there is no, um, I suppose, uh, certainty that any investigation will be easy or simple. We know that the hardcore infringers always hide their identities, give fake names, fake um, contact details. Um, but if they operate through um, their own sites, then we have the means of blocking it. If they operate through online platforms and marketplace, there's always this intermediary where some information, legit information, is kept by the online marketplace or retailers. Um, and if they refuse to cooperate, there's always the last resort um, to go to court to compel the disclosure of the identity, where it, uh, where, whether it is actually to compel um, the online marketplace or the telco provider, it depends. But there, there is, of course, the last resort legal means of um, going to court to, to actually uh, get the identity. Uh, we haven't, we have actually done, uh, gone to court to get discovery orders before. Uh, to compel the disclosure of uh, identity of um, the some of these uh, infringers. So it, it has worked, but it is usually, you know, a, a last resort is the investigation. However, whatever we have done, it doesn't give us uh, any uh, further lead. Thanks, Yuling, for your comments. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. A slightly tough one. <laughs> um, okay, this is uh, in respect of grey market goods. I'm going to paraphrase this question. Uh, I, th I think the question goes, uh, typically there are grey market goods out there. Uh, I think the example given here are watches. They are original, uh, but they are not sold at the boutique price. Uh, what, what actions can be taken against uh, such resellers of these uh, grey market goods? Maybe Siuling can take this question. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, I, I mean, our, our topic today is all, you know, counterfeits and in, infringing goods. And I think gray, gray market will probably need a, a separate session. Uh, 
grey market goods or parallel import goods or second-hand original goods, I mean, they are original goods because they are marked with the trademarks that, uh, you know, uh, by the brand owners themselves. So you can't, you can't, as a rule of thumb, you can't really prevent a resale of original goods. And there are, you know, various sites and uh, places online that actually, you know, like eBay and all that sell um, pre-owned or, or, or even um, grey market goods. However, there could be um, ways to look at whether uh, under the laws of each country, um, these goods comply with uh, regulations that are prescribed. Um, for instance, um, medicine drugs, I think, um, that, and food products, uh, there are local regulations that need to be complied. So just, just straightforward parallel imported goods from another country may not be legitimate goods in this country. Um, although we may not be able to rely strictly on um, IP laws as such to take action against uh, parallel imported goods, there could be some room to maneuver. Watches will be a bit tough. Again, it depends on how these watches are being sold. Now, if, if, um, if the uh, party that merchant that sells the watches or a person who puts it up and does it in a way that suggests um, that it has been endorsed by the um, IP owner or that the sale is with the knowledge and consent, then perhaps we can do something about that. So it depends on also the way the, um, the grey goods are actually uh, displayed, uh, promoted, marketed and sold uh, online. So there is no, I suppose, hard and dry uh, method but you need to assess whether in that particular situation it has uh, infringed any law, whether it's IT or any other regulations. Okay, uh, anyone has anything to add to, to Siling's comments? Maybe Sitira? Yeah. Just, just a short comment from my actual experience. For online, for online infringers who sell grey market products, in order to make their website look beautiful, they always use the pictures from the genuine catalog or something like that. So we usually uh, uh, take action with them, not based on uh, uh, the, the gray market product because a gray market is uh, not illegal in Thailand, but we use copyright act instead to, to take actions against them because they, they, they use uh, uh, copyright materials of, of our clients. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you, Titirat, for that uh, for the comment. I think that's very useful. Okay, we have come to the end of the seminar, of this webinar. Just to wrap up the discussion this morning, um, there are many ways or strategies to tackle online infringement, but it is very important to go in with, with a strategy. It's never going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Okay, for a successful anti-counterfeiting strategy, brand protection or IP protection is key, and brand owners must ensure that they have a solid IP portfolio so that it can avail itself to the measures to combat counterfeits. And always remember that you're not alone. Reach out to the online marketplaces, the e-commerce associations, regulators, your IP advisors, lawyers, and include them in your online anti-counterfeiting strategies. Many thanks to our guest speaker, Rofi, for taking the time to share his experiences. It was really, really useful. Thank you also to my colleagues in Zico IP across the region for your insights and comments. I, I, I believe they are very, very practical and um, and I hope that the uh, audience uh, would, would benefit from that. Now to our audience tuning in today, thank you very much for taking the time to attend this webinar. You have been great. And for those who have sent in your questions uh, and we have not answered them, we will reach out to you. Uh, the recording of this webinar will also be sent to you in an email and will be made available on our website with more resources. Now for, we also have a seminar coming up next week, a weekly, our, as part of our weekly seminar, webinars. Uh, it is in relation to practical considerations for creditor bailout in the COVID-19 aftermath. So please continue to tune in next week. That's all for us from Zico IP today. Goodbye, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.